This presentation is on the NICHD Data and Specimen Hub, a controlled access data repository. And in this presentation, we will focus specifically on the control mechanisms that are in place for providing access to data from DASH. We will start off with an overview of DASH, including at a high level, the process and policy requirements for submitting data, as well as accessing data from DASH. And then we will delve into the control mechanisms in place based on DASH policy for accessing data from DASH. We will then quickly review some resources that are available in DASH for data requesters. DASH was established by NICHD as a centralized resource for researchers to share de-identified data from studies funded by NICHD. Just a quick note here, there are studies that are not necessarily funded by NICHD in DASH, but these studies are relevant to NICHD's mission. DASH also serves as a portal for requesting biospecimens from select studies in DASH, and these biospecimens are stored in the NICHD biorepository. DASH was launched in August 2015, and so we are about seven years old now, and it is governed by a core group of NICHD staff who have broad expertise in data sharing. You can see where we are with DASH in the metrics bar below. As of today, we have 203 studies in DASH, spanning about 50 study topics. And if you look to the right of the slide, you see the top study topics represented. It includes a broad range of topics starting from preconception through pregnancy, adolescence, to adult health and women's health. Essentially, these topics represent the diverse portfolio that NICHD funds. There are about 487 data requests that have been approved in DASH as of now, and they're continuing to grow. These requests have resulted in about 74 data use publications. Also, as of now, there are nine studies offering biospecimens that includes over 350,000 specimens. And I just wanna highlight one particular study the Mothers and Infants Cohort Study that is in DASH. This is an HIV study conducted in the 1980s, and this study has mothers who were HIV positive but were never treated with antiretrovirals. So this is a unique study with a unique set of biospecimens, and in many ways, the study cannot be replicated. And as you can see at the stage, there have been 11 biospecimen requests from those nine studies. And on the right side, bottom of the slide, you can see the list of biospecimens that are currently available through DASH. We will now go through an overview of the submission and request process in DASH based on the policy that has been established for DASH. This is at a high level here, but we'll go into the details of the data request and access process in subsequent slides. But if you look to the left side, we have NICHD funded investigators who come into DASH to submit de-identified data. They are required to submit along with the de-identified data an institutional certification, attesting to the fact that the data has been de-identified of all 18 HIPAA identifiers as per the DASH policy. The institutional certification must also attest that the submission or the sharing of data through DASH is consistent with the informed consent. The submitters are also required to provide some study documentation. These documents help with the meaning, meaningful reuse of the data and includes the study protocol, data collection instruments, et cetera. And then if they have biospecimens av available for sharing from the study, and these specimens are stored in the NICHD biorepository, 
they can submit the de-identified biospecimen catalog. The catalog is essentially information about biospecimens, such as type, amount available, participant age, et cetera. And this catalog helps researchers who are coming in to search for biospecimens in terms of what they might want or the, what they might be interested in. So now looking to the right, we have investigators who want to request data or specimens. As you can see, for requesting and accessing data, they must comply with certain requirements. One is that they need to submit a research plan which should be elaborate enough. Second, they need to execute a DUA with an ICHD. Third, all data requests must be approved by the DASH Data Access Committee. Similarly, for biospecimens, they must provide a research plan, submit a material transfer agreement that is executed between their institution and an NICHD, and obtain approval from the DASH Biospecimen Access Committee. So as you can see here, sharing and access of data in DASH are kind of like two sides of a coin. There are control mechanisms in place for submission of data on the one side, and there are control mechanisms in place for accessing the data on the other side. We will go into some of the details in the coming slides. So this slide shows the DASH policy requirements for data submissions. A submitter must comply with all of these policy requirements that are shown here. So data submitters are required to de-identify the data of all 18 HIPAA identifiers. This includes the subject ID or the participant ID or the medical record number, whatever is used to collect the data. These have to be de-identified and coded, and keys to the code are retained by the submitting institutions. As I mentioned earlier, they must submit an institutional certification signed by an authorized organizational representative. Many of you know them as AOR or signing official. The institutional certification from the submitting institution must attest that an IRB or an equivalent privacy board has determined that the sharing of data through DASH is consistent with the informed consent and that the data has been de-identified as per DASH policy. The data that is submitted to DASH must be individual level data that is cleaned, de-identified, and useful for secondary analysis. And in terms of the study documentation that must be submitted, there are four required study documentation. These are study protocol, code book, also called as data dictionary, data collection instruments, and de-identification methodology. There are some optional documentation that the submitters can provide, such as the data collection methodology or analysis plan, publications, et cetera. So if you go into DASH, you will see that there is study overview page for each study in DASH. The study overview page actually provides a summary of the study and also lists all of the documentation available for the study from DASH. So someone who wants to understand what type of data and information there is in a study can actually access the study documents after registering in DASH. They can look at all these documentation prior to deciding whether to request data from DASH. With that, we want to go into the main focus of this presentation, which is what are the control mechanisms that are in place in DASH, both from a process standpoint and from a policy standpoint. This slide shows at a high level the process that a requester would go have to go through to request and access data from DASH. So requesters must submit what is called a data request form. This is an online form where they provide the research plan. They will complete and submit it along with the data use agreement 
signed by their AOR or signing official. And if the informed consent for the study requires that an IRB approve the data request, then that approval must also be submitted by the data requester. Once these items are submitted in DASH, the DASH team then manages some of the steps that are shown here in green. First, if the study requires study-specific entity approval, as per the informed consent, then we facilitate the review and obtain approval. Then we get the review of the DASH Data Access Committee. We will go into the details of the committee and the elements that they look for when they're reviewing requests in a later slide. But as the committee reviews, the study program officer, who's also very familiar with the study, will review the request and send any comments to the data access committee. However, the program officer does not have approval authority. It is only the DASH data access committee that can review and approve a particular request. Now, when they review the request, if there are issues, it is sent back to the requester. A couple of examples where it is sent back to the requester are, for example, if they've not provided an elaborate or detailed research plan, or if the data that they need for sufficiently or successfully executing their research plan is not available in DASH. In such cases, the request is denied, and of course, the data requester is informed of that. Otherwise, the data request is approved in DASH, the requester can come into DASH and download the data as well as the study documentation. So as you can see, there are multiple steps here, and each of those are set in place based on the policy that has been developed in DASH for data access. Now here, we will start looking at some of those policy requirements for data access that every requester must comply with. Um, first of all, they must submit a research plan. We mentioned that earlier in the online data request form. The research plan must be a brief description of the proposed research use of the data. Secondly, they should get approval of the request from the data access committee. So as I mentioned, every request is reviewed by the data access committee. And then finally, they must submit the data use agreement signed by their institutional authorized organizational representative and the data recipient. You can see some of the specifics about the DUA here. It is the requester's institution that's responsible for the terms and conditions of the DUA, not the recipient per se. The institution is held responsible for all of the terms and conditions of the data use agreement. We will go into some of the details of the terms and conditions later. The DOA is valid for three years. The recipients can, of course, renew their DOA for continued use of the data. Each data recipient is permitted to have multiple data users from their own institution working on the same research plan and we call them affiliates. Now, if there are individuals from different institutions working with the data recipient on the same research plan, what we call as collaborators, they must execute a separate DOA. We'll go into some of the details of those policy-based control mechanisms. First is the review by the Data Access Committee. As I mentioned, all data requests are reviewed and must be approved by the Data Access Committee for requesters to be able to obtain access to data from DASH. The primary objective of the Data Access Committee is to make sure that access to data from DASH aligns with the DASH policy. The committee is, is composed of staff with a relevant expertise in various scientific disciplines, human subject data management, and research participant protection and privacy. 
these are a very, this is a very passionate group of individuals and they thoroughly review the request. And you can see some of the elements of their review um, in these sub bullets. They check to make sure that the request for data does not conflict um, with the research data use limitations specified in the informed consent. They also make sure that the requester has met any IRB requirements as defined by the informed consent. And then the requested study contains the data sets that are appropriate to address the requester's proposed research plan. And then finally, that the request is consistent with the informed consent and all applicable regulations for human subject research protection and privacy protection. Another control that is exerted for data access is through the data use agreement. When data is submitted to DASH, NICHD becomes the custodian of the data. So the DUA is executed by the recipient's institution with NICHD. And as you can see here, <clears throat> the data use agreement terms and conditions are pretty rigorous. Um, the DUA is actually available on the DASH website, and you're welcome to go and check out the details of the DUA. Um, there is a sample template available for everyone uh, to view. But here are some of the major highlights of the DUA in terms of the terms and conditions. The research data can only be used for the approved research plan. If uh, the data recipient changes their research plan in any way, they are required to submit a new data request and a new data use agreement. They must not share the data with individuals other than those listed in the DOA. So as I mentioned earlier, all affiliates from their own institution are listed in the DOA. And if they have collaborators, we also make note of that in, the, in DASH. So the recipient is only allowed to share the data with those listed in the DOA. The recipient is also required to protect research data confidentiality and must not attempt to identify the individual study participants. They must follow all security protections for data, both at the institutional level, as well as all of the applicable laws, regulations, and institutional policies and procedures for handling the data. Very importantly, if they do violate the terms and conditions in any way, they are required to report the violations to DASH immediately. For non-material breaches, they can remediate it within 30 days for continued use of the data. Now, if there are material breaches, there are more severe consequences and penalties. It could lead to termination of the data request, as well as the institution is held responsible and may be barred from getting data from DASH in the future. Also, NICHD could potentially take some injunctive relief actions. If there is a violation, they are required to destroy the data immediately. All data recipients are also required to submit an annual use report of their data. And as I said earlier, the data use agreement is for a three year period. So they have to submit an annual use report every year and any changes to individuals who are using the data, any changes in any way to the original data request. They need to inform us through the annual use report. Um, in fact, they are actually required to notify us as soon as there is a change in personnel, but they definitely need to indicate that in the annual use report. They must also indicate if there are any significant findings or publications that have come out from their data use. And then when the DUA term is completed, they must destroy all the data and they need to inform us about that as well. So as you can see, we just reviewed multiple control mechanisms that are in place in DASH before a data requester can get access to data. 
So now we will go into some resources that are available for data requesters. We have a number of resources available. Some of them are general, some of them are more specific to data request. Um, in terms of general resources, they can review the DASH policy, which is pretty ex ex extensive, both in terms of the stipulations for data submission as well as data request. The policy actually also covers at a high level the process that one has to undertake to obtain data from DASH or biospecimens from DASH. There is also frequently asked questions and the uh, tutorial that requesters can use to understand the process and get data from DASH. And as I mentioned, there are some specific request resources, such as the data request checklist that tells them all they need to have in place before they can go through the whole request process successfully. They can also look at the data use agreement in advance. We have that sample template available, uh, but it is when they actually go through the online process, when they get the formal data use agreement that they would have to take to their organizational representative, get the signature and submit it back to DASH. This concludes the presentation on controlled access to DASH data.